Hello there and welcome to Miss Yusuf's English class. In this video, we are going to learn Pulches by Chinua Achebe. Some background notes on the poet. Chinua Achebe was born in Nigeria in 1930. He studied at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and taught at various universities in Nigeria and the United States. Achebe wrote novels and essays as well as poetry. His novels trace Africa's transition from traditional to modern ways. Achebe believed that a good work of art should have a purpose, an idea that originates in the oral tradition of storytelling in Africa. His works look at the relationship between African mysticism and modern Western culture. Achebe died in 2013. Okay, let's read Vultures by Chinua Achebe. In the grayness and drizzle of one despondent dawn, and stirred by harbingers of sunbake, a vulture, perching high on broken bone of a dead tree, nestled close to his mate. His smooth bashed in head, a pebble on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers, inclined affectionately to hers. Yesterday they picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench and ate the things in its bowel. Full gorged, they chose their roost, keeping the hollow remnant in easy range of cold telescopic eyes. Strange indeed how love in other ways so particular will pick a corner in that charnel house, tidy it and coil up there, perhaps even fall asleep. Her face turned to the wall. Thus the commanded at Belson camp going home for the day with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously to his ho uh, hairy nostrils will stop at the wayside sweet shop and pick up some chocolate for his tender offspring waiting at home for daddy's return. Praise bounteous providence if you will that grants even an ogre, a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart, or else despair. For in the very germ of that kindred love, is lodged the perpetuity of evil. Okay, before getting into the analysis, this is a very, very vivid poem. It's got incredibly vivid imagery, and it's also quite disturbing in its uh, in its description. And I think that the purpose of the 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 imagery that is meant to shock the reader and meant to make us uncomfortable and really think about the message of the poem, really consider and internalize the um, the themes of the poem. And to see just how similar to animals human beings behave. And um, this poem is divided up into three parts. You've got the beginning, the first part, which is focused on the vultures, the animals, uh, the birds. And then you have a uh, line 30 going on into the human element of the poem, which is the commanded at Belson camp. And the last uh, section of the poem starts on uh, line 41. And here you have a choice as a reader, as an observer, as a commentator to look at the first part of the poem and look at the second part of the poem and decide how you wish to view humanity and how you, um, how you consider uh, what human beings are. And if you are lost at this point, don't worry, I'll take you through it step by step. Right, let's break it down. In the grayness and drizzle of one despondent dawn, unstirred by harbingers of sunbreak, a vulture perching high on broken bone of a dead tree nestled close to his mate. Right, the first three lines immediately has got a very, very gloomy uh, disposition. There's uh, an environment that's very dark, very dismal, right? Grayness, drizzle, not sunshine and happiness. Okay, so the speaker automatically opens the poem with a very gloomy uh, image. And you have the despondence of the dawn, very lazy, very, um, very pessimistic. Unstirred by harbingers of sunbreak, yeah, all of those signs that herald the morning, they're absent. Okay, so it's very dull, very dark, very gloomy, portentous, ominous, uh, sinister almost. Right, and then we focus on a vulture. A vulture is perching high on broken bone of a dead tree and he is nestled close to his mate. So because of the cold, you have a vulture that is nestling close to his mate. You have a girl vulture and a boy vulture. On a, uh, they perched high on a broken bone of a dead tree. The word dead here, it's a theme in the poem, death. 
and uh, this is our first introduction to that theme uh, the image of death and destruction and the element of the vulture contributing in some way to that uh, that end the death right here's a description of the vulture okay his smooth bashed in head a pebble on a stem rooted in a dump of gross feathers right not a very flattering description of the vulture at all you've got three parts of the vulture's body the top part is his smooth bashed in head uh, it looks like a pebble that is standing on top of a stem and that stem continues which is obviously the neck and ends in a dump gross of feather uh, a dump of gross feathers gross again very unflattering very uh, unpleasant description describing the bird basically looking like a stone that's stuck on a stick and ends in a dump of very unsightly feathers uh, bashed in of course um, vultures are are carrion eaters they are at the bottom of the predatory food chain so they would eat the rotting meat left behind by all the other higher uh, food chain um, predators and uh, they would fight over fight over uh, meat and, 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 and prey because they are that kind of animal they would bash each other up and that is why his head looks very injured as a result of all of this bashing other other birds for the uh, food that they could uh, get their hands on get their claws on to survive right inclined affectionately to hers here immediately you have a paradox you have a, a very unattractive description of the bird but in the in, in inclined affectionately to hers you have an image of, of a pleasant scene this boy vulture has got his head inclined toward her the girl vulture very affectionately okay again very surprising very unexpected earlier we saw that he was perched on a dead tree with his mate now you've got this very unattractive description of the bird inclined toward her with affection okay you're going to see that these paradoxes are apparent throughout the poem let's look at the lifestyle that this couple leads yesterday they picked the eyes of a swollen corpse in a waterlogged trench a uh, trench sorry and ate the things in its bowl continuing that very unpleasant very disturbing image yesterday this couple had picked the eyes of a swollen corpse we are not told what animal the corpse was and it was um they found it in a waterlogged trench of course it would have been rotted it would have been bloating it would have been uh on the verge of of decomposition or in the process of decomposition um and they ate the things in its bowl right so these birds are, not, are indiscriminate they, they would eat whatever they can get their hands on and this is taking me for some reason to the description of the hyena in the life of pi where those animals as well would eat anything um so this character of the vulture very similar in quality to that very indiscriminate uh, in their in their eating habits they would eat whatever they can get their hands on they picked the eyes of that corpse whatever that animal was before it died and they ate the things in its bowl obviously the things in its bowl would have been uh, also on that verge or on that in that process of decomposition um again the speaker is, is is upsetting us as readers right but you're going to see what it's going to do to that image in a minute Right. Once they were, uh, once they were full, full gorge, they chose their roost, keeping the hollowed remnant in easy range of cold telescopic eyes. After they ate, right, they chose a place to nest. But they made sure that the place that they chose to nest and lay their eggs and 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 um, allow their offspring to to be born and to to raise them, they chose a, a, a roost that was very within their range, very easily accessible to them and in such a way and in such a place that they could easily get to it so again the previous lines were very upsetting line telling us about the eating habits and how they picked the eyes of the the dead corpse and how they ate the things in its bowl immediately you have a paradox here where it shows some sort of parental care some kindred care some familial obligation that these vultures are, are, are uh, taking quite seriously because they're actually picking a home for their their offspring that is within their range, within their eyesight, and they could um, watch over their, their, their babies from wherever they are. Again, that paradox is, is quite surprising, it's quite interesting.
okay? And again, keep in mind that we're talking about vultures here, we're talking about animals here, we're talking about birds of prey here. And um, it's almost as though they have a conscience, it's almost as though they have human feelings, their affection for each other, their responsibility toward their offspring. It's a very interesting paradigm because it's putting us into the mind of a vulture almost. I need to take care of my mate. I need to feed my family and sustain my children. I need to find a home that's safe for my children. It's almost a human uh, quality that these vultures have, right? Strange, that's exactly the word that I'm using. Strange indeed how love in other ways so particular will pick a corner in that charnel house, tidy it and coil up there, perhaps even fall asleep her face turned to the wall right strange indeed right how um how when you are choosing a mate you would choose somebody of 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 a particular character or a particular characteristic or a particular value system right and and again here you all have an almost human uh, parallel here to say that even these vultures as long as they are together they would pick any place to make a home, neaten it up and live there as long as they have each other, as long as they have this um, this affection and this affinity between them. It doesn't matter where they live, it doesn't matter what kind of situation they are in, as long as they are together as a family and as a couple, right? A charnel house is a place where human remains are kept, okay? Again, that theme of death uh, is, is continued here by the speaker. And... Um, it says even the vultures wouldn't even mind living among dead bodies and, and bones or, and human remains. They would live there as long as the family is all together, right? They feel secure enough to even fall asleep. They feel safe enough to even fall asleep. Right, now you have the human element of the poem being introduced. We are done with the vultures, okay? Thus the commanded at Belson camp going home for the day with fumes of human roast clinging rebelliously, rebelliously to his hairy nostrils. Um, a description again of a human, a man, right? He is a commandant, he is a, uh, a, a, an official personnel at Belson camp and his day is over, uh, his work is over for the day and he's going home now. But there is a smell that's clinging to him, the smell of human flesh right? Human skin burning. And it's, it's clinging to him no matter if he had a bath, no matter if he changed his clothes, he would still have that smell with him, right? He will stop at the wayside sweet shop and pick up some chocolate for his tender offspring who is waiting at home for daddy's return. Right, now Belson Camp, if you know your Holocaust history, Bergen-Belsen camp was a, 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 a concentration camp where Jews were kept and executed. And some of the most famous, well, one of the most famous uh, prisoners at Belsen camp was Anne Frank, who we know was executed from her diaries of Anne Frank. Um, th this is the place where they would burn human beings alive just for their religious beliefs. They would uh, gas people. They would execute people. They would do inhumane, unthinkable things to human beings. And this man, after his day of doing all of these things, when his work is done for the day, he will travel home and stop at a shop and buy sweeties for his child. And all the child knows about daddy is that he's coming home and he's bringing me sweets. In the same way, the vultures' babies are not going to care that my parents just ate the eyes of a dead corpse. Well, not a dead corpse, a corpse. And the things in its stomach. They are not going to worry about that. All they care about is my parents are here and they are sustaining me. In the same way, this child is not going to judge their parent for what they're doing. They're just going to know that my father is home now. Okay? And um, again, you have the parallel, the human-animal parallel where... It doesn't matter what the vultures and the humans are doing the day, doing during the day. Their children see them in a way that is affectionate and 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 delicate and uh, caring. Okay, so this is the intention of the speaker. He wants us to see that why we were disgusted at the animals and why we were very upset and very disturbed by the behavior and the lifestyle of the animals. Human beings are not so different. The difference is, human beings have a choice. 
what separates human beings from animals is that capacity to choose, is that conscience, is that conscientious choice, either to do something that is wrong and evil and wicked or not do something that is wrong and evil and wicked. Animals don't have that choice. Right, so the last part of the poem, like I told you, poses a question, or poses a choice rather, to the reader. You've seen what the animals can do. You've seen what the human beings do. Now you as a person can choose to consider the character of the grown-up, the adult, the parent, or the character of the child. Let's look. Praise bounteous providence, if you will, that grants even an ogre a tiny glowworm tenderness encapsulated in icy caverns of a cruel heart. Or else, despair, for in the very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. So you have a choice now. You can either thank nature, thank God, thank wherever life comes from, that no matter how horrible a human being is, they do have a capacity, no matter how small it is, no matter how tiny it is, no matter how uh, delicate it is, they do have that tiny little capacity for love, right? In the vultures, they would eat rotting flesh, but they will take care of their children. The human being will spend his day executing human beings, but he'll take his, uh, a sweet home for his child. No matter what evil they have done, they have the p capacity potential for this love. On the other hand, consider the child. Or else despair, for in that very germ of that kindred love is lodged the perpetuity of evil. On the other hand, you could look at the child and you could despair because the very character that the parents, either the vulture or the human beings have, that same blood, that same DNA, that same nature is being passed on to the next generation. And when they grow up, they are going to continue this perpetual cycle of evil, death, indiscriminate, indiscriminate slaughter. Okay, so this is the very, very unpleasant, very, very disturbing choice that we as readers have. Thank nature for that capacity, no matter how small it is, for good or despair, because the very children that they take care of are going to grow up and have that same nature and continue that cycle of evil, whether they are animal or human. Okay, this brings us to the end of the poem. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that none of these images belong to me. All images credit to the artist or whoever they belong to. I found them on Google and I do not claim to own any of the images used in the uh, video. But if I need to take it down, kindly let me know in the comments and I will work on removing them. Thank you for joining me. Until the next poem, I'll see you then. Take care of yourself.